Okay, so you've written your rough draft at this point, and then you are going to move on to your next assignment. So the title of today's assignment is Great Writers Steal. Well, that caught your attention because you know teachers don't want to allow you to steal, it's plagiarism. But I want to draw your attention to the title. It's catchy. Now I know they say don't judge a book by its cover, but unfortunately that's life and we do judge books by, books by their cover. I can't tell you how many times I have picked up or put down a book because I liked or disliked the title or the cover. Now, great books are found behind boring titles and boring um, images. However, in a world where so much is being thrown at us, it is important to catch your audience quickly because you're going to lose them if you don't. So when you're thinking of, of what to title your narrative, remember that you have one chance to grab the reader and you might only get that one chance. So when looking at today's assignment, it says you should read a few of these narratives and borrow or steal things that you like about them. So when you are struggling to improve your narrative or you don't know where to go next, a great strategy is to look towards your favorite authors and see what they do that you like and you implement that skill into your narrative. They are uh, experts in the field, they have found success, so they're clearly doing something right. So the first text uh, really grabbed my attention because of the title. My dad tried to kill me with an alligator. So what I'm going to do today with you is I'm simply going to read the text, um, and I've never read it before, and I'm going to go through and do a read aloud and just highlight things that I like about this author. And you can borrow you know, my notes, or you may not agree with me. So I'm going to open it up. And then I'm also going to open up a Word document and I'm going to split my screen. And the reason I'm gonna do this is just so I can take notes and you can see what things I'm highlighting as I read. And I would recommend doing this for each text that you read. So then you don't have to go back and reread it and find the stuff that you were looking for. All right. So it is called, My Dad Tried to Kill Me with an Alligator. Always read the, the caption underneath the title. Um, and a lot of times it gives you insight. And I, for some reason, students always seem to skip over this. All right. So the Pearl River is full of trash, Volkswagen-sized catfish, and a heck of a lot of gators. Swimming in it? That was Pop's idea. So this is clearly a, a memoir or a narrative about his crazy dad, because who would want to swim in a river that has fish the size of cars um, and alligators. Uh, not me. All right. Follow along. You can follow along with my screen or you can open up your own document. In the summer of 1987, my father tried to murder me with an alligator. He was always doing fun stuff like that to see if we would die. Sometimes he tried to murder us with other things like gasoline. When we'd say to our pop, the leaves won't burn. Okay, so I already love this guy's tone. Fun stuff like that. Heck of a, I'm gonna say likes. I'm gonna put dislikes for Jason Williams. Okay, authors, tone, and word choice. In rural Mississippi, my brother and I were always burning things like leaves and garbage, garbage and carcasses. And sometimes he told us to put gas on the fire because he believed a fire could teach boys about life. Sometimes he tried to murder us with, recre with recreational watercraft. This happened on our way to fish in the Pearl River where he enjoyed piloting our venture bass boat at speeds typically reserved for cosmonaut training. He'd cut perpendicular across the wake, launching skyward. The bow of our glittering boat pinched so high that it obscured the rising sun and we'd slam back down on the water so hard, it felt like we'd landed on the interstate. This day, I cannot injure my cox without thinking fondly of the man. All right, so I like his word choice and I like his humor too. So if you didn't catch it while he was on the boat with his dad, his dad seems kind of like a rebel or like a badass and 
clearly he seeks danger because he's driving this boat at speeds that are, are scaring his little kid. As a boy, my interests largely concern the life of the mind, writing poems, reading about the origins of Latin Vulgate, following through science fiction stories about Captain Nemo and in his Nautilus. The only thing I'd ever seen my father read was a booklet about how to mask your odors in the woods with a bobcat urine. Sometimes it was hard to believe he was even my father. Is it safe to go so fast, I'd asked, after he'd tried to outrun a jet ski with his boat? I didn't mind being in the boat with him. It was nice, but I did mind being out of the boat, especially when there were alligators in the water. And there were on that day in 1987. Get in, he said, sir, in. I was 12 and my brother was 15 and it was July and we were bored. Hey, fart tart, my brother said, want to go fishing? He'd start calling me fart tart because he thought I was fat, which I was owing it to a glandular disorder that made me eat Pop-Tarts until I stopped feeling sad. My brother was tall and blonde, and so we called him Bird, as in Big Bird. It didn't seem fair, his being nicknamed for a character designed to jo give joy to children, while I'd been named for a food product designed to give children diabetes. Fishing, I said, just you and me? Bird possessed two key components to being a true adolescent badass, a driver's license and a mullet. He'd also been shot in the eye with a pellet rifle, which split his pupil in half and made him squint, which made him look like a pirate. I might be dangerous, it might be dangerous, going to the river with Bird, but it also felt like a badass thing to do. Okay, I said. Pop wanted to say no, you could tell. It's written somewhere in boating safety manuals that you don't let people named Bird and Fart Tart borrow your bass boat, even if they are your own sons but some part of him must have been proud seeing his boys ask permission to do something that could get them killed. Pop agreed to let us go and gave a stern warning that if anything happened to his boat, he would have our rectum surgically removed and turned into hats. Mom warned us too. Watch out for those giant catfish, she said. Okay, so I also love the characterization. the development of his dad. I love this because his, you know, his, you can tell his dad wants his son to be the typical men, men. And they're warning him not about saving his life or not dying, but more about hurting the boat and watching out for fish. This tells you a lot about his parents. Also, I love the development of his brother. I think the nicknames are hysterical. We all heard about the giant blue cats in the Pearl River, the ones who swallowed scuba divers whole, although nobody could ever produce the names of the divers or who anyone or why anyone would choose to recreationally dive into a river not generally known to contain either coral reefs or visibility. Besides, there were real there were realer things in that water, like massive knots of water moccasins and snapping turtles the size of laundry baskets and not a prehistoric fish with the face of a <laughs> pterodactyl of, and teeth of Gary Bushy. Okay, this imagery is hysterical. Also present, alligator Mississippi Nessus. Uh, I'm don't. I'm sure that's a real thing. I am going to look this up because I wonder what this looks like. Actually, why don't we do that right now? I'm wondering if this is a joke or if this is a real thing. Okay. Well, this is an American alligator. This is what came up. So at least we have an image. I'm telling you right now, I'm not swimming anywhere that these things belong. They were everywhere, lying on the sandbars, slinking out of the mudslides, head, heads pushing up through fields of lily pads. Sometimes they'd bite your lure. If, if the crank bait was fat enough, it was a powerful thing to find yourself fighting the heft of a 600 pound, 37 million year old boob. I bet a gator would like to eat you, fart tart, fat tart. 
Bert said, he stuck a finger into my fat fatness and made a farting sound, as though to suggest I was full of strawberry filling. You think we'll see one, I said? I ain't scared of gators, Bert said. Shit, gators ought to be scared of me. Again, I like the dialogue here. I can picture the brother and his slang. I ain't scared of gators. And the dialogue. Slang. And picture brother. The Pearl River is a lovely old thing, slow and coppery and traced in fine sandy bars for 500 miles on its way to the Gulf. Off the main channel, it's home to wild peacocks and black bears and other things with mouths. Bird and I fished in the mid-morning haze and I watched the water with interest, trying to pretend like I was not looking madly for the thing I knew was down there. Let's swim, Bird said. No thanks. You scared? No, it's just I don't wanna die. It's an interesting sensation, knowing there's something underneath you that could eat you, and all you have to do is fall in, and there it would be, this creature, terrible enough to be in the book of Job, a thing that cannot be drawn out with a mere fish hook. There, Bert said. I turned and saw it, the flat, wide, serrated head, scrutinizing us. We waited, frozen in the sodden heat our poles dangling, the line growing slack, knotted up in the deep. We watched the black eyes of this biblical monster. When it looked at us, what did it see? Did it wish for some animal fellowship, some longing in its bones since the time of Eden? Had some metaphysical vibration drawn it to the surface to seek spiritual intercourse with these two brothers so very near, this Abel and this Cain, all ages, an epochs of earth co uh, collapsing into just a few feet of water and air? Had I read too many books, tried to build too much meaning into every moment? Was this merely a large amphibious predator who wished to eat us? Or was it a metaphor drawing me towards something deeper, some truth that lay hidden underneath, under the black water? Let's catch it, Bird said. Catch it? I got my pistol, he said. A 22 is all it takes. All right, so I'm gonna come over here. Again, I love the dialogue. I love the no, ta uh, the no tag here. And we'll go over that in the next video. So um, I love no tag in conversation. The reason I like it is because it makes the, the the atmosphere of the conversation go quickly. It feels very tense. Quick. Uh, so this is called an allusion to a, a, another text, a, a biblical text, and I actually don't like it. But I think it requires too much from, from the reader. So I don't like the use of allusion here. Um, I think that it's lo it's going to be lost on a lot of the readers. If you didn't know that he was alluding to, uh, you know, the Bible and and stuff, then that kind of just goes over your head. Okay. Bird wished to carry home the fiend, I think, and present it to our father as evidence of of our being men and also insane. He cast a spinner bait at its head. Please stop, I said. I bet you could ride one. You're making it mad. Good. Bird cast and cast again, trying to convince the animal to bite, to come closer, the line zipping out, the lure plopping near its teeth. And then the beast descended and was gone. I turned my head to see where it would come up for air. And in all my twisting, a terrible thing happened. I knocked out one of the rods. Get it, Bird said. I lurched, threw myself across the gunwale, reaching out across the black. The boat tipped, rocked, dipped, rocked. If I leaned more, we might capsize. That means to turn over the boat. In seconds, the rod would be gone. I'm trying, get it, I'm trying. The rod bobbed there, for, bobbed there just below the surface, its last bubbles escaping, and then vanished. 
We sat there for a long time. That's a 200 fucking dollar rod. 200 fucking dollars sounded like a lot, like drug dealer money. It was an Abu Garcia, a present from Pop, a heavy and beautiful rod built to last forever. If you didn't know, he's talking about a fishing pole. What do we do, I said. The fuck you think we do, fat, fat, fat tart, he said. Go get it. We started at the water some more. We stared, sorry, we stared at the water some more. Go, he said. I was waiting on you to go. I ain't going. If an alligator attacked Bird, I believe he might actually have the ability to punch it in the head and get away, while my own defensive tactic was to go limp as, cur as a courtesy to whatever might be trying to eat me. Fuck it, Bird said. Yeah, fuck it, I said, trying to sound badass. We reached out, we reached the outer edges of our courage and found it wanting. Later that, at, late that afternoon, we told Pop and he did something even more upsetting that, than turning our asses into hats. Hitch up the boat, he said, we're going back. Pop drove like a man possessed. He'd thrown a few strange, strange items into the boat, but we couldn't see what did, whoop, I'm sorry, let me start over. Pop drove like a man possessed. He'd thrown a few strange items into the boat, but we couldn't see what. Did he really think we could find the rod? I sort of pitied him. Or maybe what I felt was embarrassment, that this, would, this was the man who made me, this loud and reckless and ignorant man who did not read books. Maybe it's obvious to suggest that there comes a time in a child's life when he stopped believing that his father is Superman and sees that he is just a man with his own nameless spiritual diseases. And for me, I think that, I think this was that time. When we arrived, what I saw in the boat disturbed me. There, he'd placed a large old stop sign we'd found years before by the side of the road and an assortment of industrial strength hooks large enough to snag a left then. <laughs> Hmm. I don't know what this word means. So I am going to look it up. Oh, okay. So let's see. I think it's a mythical creature. Oh, okay. It's a sea serpent uh, in uh, Jewish mythology. So the hooks must be pretty big. We got the boat into the water. Take me to where you was, he said. Oh, I like this. Where you was? It's supposed to be where, where you were. And I think that the author intentionally in, uh, in the dialogue used incorrect grammar um, to show his dad's lack of intelligence. So slang, um, incorrect grammar. What was he going to do with a stop sign? Hit somebody with it? Threaten the alligators with traffic laws? Finally, we came to the quarter of our shame. The shadows were stark now, moving, darkening. It would soon be night. Everything was blur, blue. The hour of day when bugs dance, when fish jump, when alligators feed. All right, Pop said, get in. Sir, I said. Bird jumped in and went to the bottom. Over and over, my big brother, already more a man than I would ever be. God love him. He wouldn't read a book, but he'd beat the hell out of somebody who did, if you asked him nicely. So I like, I love this. They're saying, he, he basically is saying his brother's not smart, but if you're nice to him, he'll do anything for you. He's dumb, but loyal. Now we don't, he doesn't actually say he's dumb, but loyal, but by showing his actions, uh, his brother's actions, and also showing how his our narrator feels about him shows that he is dumb and loyal. He didn't actually come out and say it, but this is really good characterization. From where we were anchored, 
I could see at least three alligators slide, alligator slides, empty. The depth finder said 12 feet. I can't, I said. I took off my shoes slowly, giving Bird plenty of time to find the rod, or at the very least to be killed and eaten, which I felt would be the most loving thing to do. Go, Pop said. What if I didn't get in? Would he throw me in? Would he know true things about me? That I was still a child? I jumped in. Immediately, I formulated a plan, which involves surrounding myself with a protective cloud of urine. <laughs> uh, he pees pants. At the bottom, when I touched my hands and feet were skeletons and teeth and the, and the hides of dinosaurs or what felt like dinosaurs. Was he proving a point? Was the rod more important than our safety, our lives, our very own bones? Keep looking, he said. I had been wrongly told that the safest place one could be when confronted by an alligator was underwater, as they could not bite you underwater. But wouldn't it be better to be somewhere even safer, like South Dakota? Bird was already out, taking a break. Suddenly, a splash echoing off the cypress wall of the swamp. I grabbed the lip of the boat and tried to pull myself out. I didn't say you were done, Pop said. I turned, and there it was, the head of the beast. Alligator, I said. Where, Pop said. Help me out, help. I struggled. My fat little twinky arms couldn't get me out of the water. Bird reached down and pulled me out. I turned, and the head was gone. You're a liar, Bird said. No, no, I said. There was something. It was then my father picked up the octagon, oct octagonal shield and affixed the enormous hooks to the bare steel posts at intervals. It, in the very center, he tied a fat nylon rope and without saying a word, lifted it up to the gunwale. He had made a dredge. Hmm, let's see what a dredge looks like. Oh, okay. So this is like a kind of like a crane for the water. So it like pulls things out. And... It was a frightening device, as gruesome as it was ridiculous, a tool to find and punish heretics, non-believers. He dropped it into the water, letting it go to the bottom. Bird smirked. Look at the old man, the fool. We had failed and he would too. And we would go home empty handed, believing in one another just a little less. We sat there, all three of us steeping in our own various disgraces, and we heard another great rumbling in the water. There she is, Pop said. I looked up and there, rising up from the black, we saw it. The rod cling to Pop's dredge. When Pop died last year, we buried him beside a river near where I now live in Savannah, Georgia. I have no sons, only daughters. Their lives are filled with no danger, but with candy and glitter. Sure, I allow them to climb trees when their mother isn't looking, but never with buck saws. This is important. Okay, so he's, you know, he's making a joke. He's saying that his dad let him do things that, you shouldn't let kids do that aren't safe. I start the sentence over again. Sure, I allowed them to climb trees when their mother isn't looking, but never with buck saws. And I never take them hunting because there are more affordable ways to bore your children. In those days after the funeral, when the evening sun fell down and the world turned blue, I found myself growing tight in the throat and wanting to put my daughters in a boat. Hey girls, I said, do you wanna to go to a, se a secret island? I was talking about little Tibby, which is not a secret, but was to them. I told them of the bobcats and diamondbacks and aggressive sea snails that lived on the island. For real, they said. We put a long kayak into the Atlantic on a hot July morning and we made our way to the island. And I'm sorry, we made our way to the island that I'm sh sure had already grown mythic and storied in their imaginations and wide, a wide piney thing across a mile of water. Could we die, one of them asked, as the narrow yellow boat rocked a little? Yes, I said. We could get swept out to the sea or drown or be attacked. By what? Sea snails, I said. I wanted them to know that safety should not be the defining virtue of their lives. 
while they want me to know that being alive should be the defining virtue of their lives. I close my eyes and try to remember what it felt like to be scared in that swamp a thousand years ago. Had I truly believed that the thing I saw in the water was the head, was a head attached to a body, attached to a tail that, as the Lord said to John, can make the deep boil? Would my father really have asked me to go near such a thing? Of course not. Maybe. We're very pop not far from here. And it wouldn't would have been possible to turn around, turn the boat up into the channel and paddle all the way to his grave through a few cuts in the marsh. It might have taken all day and we had so little water and no food, but what an adventure to arm our way through tidewater towards the man's body to do a foolish thing in honor of the man who taught his children to love foolish things. A love that had led me to the waters of Key West and the gorges of the Gila Wilderness and the glacial waters of the Wind River Range, a place I never would have gone without a father to make me get out of the boat that day in the genesis of my manhood. I am frightened of almost nothing now except my brother's mullet which haunts me still. Shark, the six-year-old screamed. Is that really a shark? The eight-year-old said. It could be a dolphin, I said. Let's see. We waited, but no happy, child-friendly aquatic mammal breached before us, just a fin, a single, purposeful, somewhat overly serious, perhaps ectothermic, possibly murderous dorsal fin, airing across the lambent ripples of midday while my children gripped the sides of the boat and asked me questions about the shark that I could not possibly know. What kind was it? How big was it? Did it want to eat them? Which one of them did it want to eat? What could we do so as to not be eaten by it? Could I kill it? Could they stay in the boat while I killed it? Can we paddle faster towards the beach? Is there a motor on this kayak? If so, can we use it to kill the shark? Why aren't you paddling? Get your knife, get your knife, dad, one of them said. If one of you gets eaten, we will name the boat after you, I said. The eight-year-old turned and gave me a look that said, is my father an idiot for bringing us out here? Of course not. Maybe. I like how the author chose not to put these uh, questions that the kids were asking into quotation marks. I'm gonna note that. <laughs> Not all conversation is in In the 30 years since the day I asked the same question, I know so much less than I ever thought I would. Every true thing has been stripped away by time and loss, and there's a thing I think I know, and it's this. Fathers, when they are doing it right, often look like fools. This is 100% an important line in understanding the message this uh, author is trying to get across. So I'm actually going to put that right there. Shark, the younger one said, the fin having reappeared only 20 yards away. Would my children tell stories about this moment long from now? Would they tell themselves it was a shark when we, when we don't know? Would they make up stories about what they cannot see, what's under the water, what's under the earth, buried and gone? Paddle, they said, trying their hardest to get to land. Girls, girls, they said, let's see if we can get closer. No, they said, I won't let it hurt you. They stopped and thought, frozen. I turned our boat and we paddled towards the monster in the water. And that's it. I also like how the author just leaves it. He doesn't actually say what it was. So the message here is not that it matters what it was. I think the message is how, you know, something about how we teach our children or to be adventurous, it's not about the, the find, it's about the process, it's about the experience. I love that. 
Okay, so in the next few videos, I'm going to go through this text and I'm gonna show you um, examples of how they've used dialogue. And I'm gonna show you um, and analyze the characterization. Cause I think that's the two features of this narrative that I like the most. I like the characterization and the development of the brother and the dad. And I love the dialogue that the author uses.